Hello, and welcome to another edition of Ask the Professor, where we respond to your questions on everything from current events to ancient history, all those things that concern the common good in our life together. Mm -hmm. Now, Isabel sent us a link to an article that appeared in the Atlantic magazine. Uh, it's called How American Politics Went Insane. And it, it's, it's a very interesting piece, a bit long. I'll put the URL uh, up so people can read it. Um, but it talks about the limits of the risk of, of direct democracy and the importance of some level of party power discipline in the context of American politics. And she says, well, of course, Canadian politics is different, but she's interested to uh, hear your views on whether or not, uh, and and if so, up to what extent uh, this uh, the, the the themes uh, explored in this piece apply to Canada. Well, first of all, I want to say to Isabel, thanks a lot for sending me a really long, <laughs> interesting article. Just what we needed. And I have to pr do that because then I'm going to say to you, it is actually a very interesting article, mm -hmm. and I'm going to summarize it very, very briefly and not do it full justice. Uh, I'm also going to say, if the question is, how did American politics go insane? Some people want to say, lots and lots of practice. And again, it's important to bear in mind that there were some strange things going on in American politics from the very beginning. We remember George Washington. We forget the abuse that was heaped on him that was so bad that one reason that he stepped down after two terms was that he was sick of being buffeted by infamous scribblers. Of course, they talked better in those days. Mm -hmm. But the essence of the piece is that the structure of politics has broken down, that the insiders, the middlemen, the backroom boys, and more recently backroom girls, have been displaced in the name of greater democracy and openness and popular access directly to power, which are all things that are very hard to argue against. And the author deserves much commendation for managing to argue against them anyway. Not foolishly, with an understanding that these things could have a downside, including both complacency and corruption. But fundamentally, the argument is that the mediating structures that used to exist and that would take popular enthusiasm and run it through the filter of experience before turning it into a political platform has gone and that things have become turbulent and angry and what one employer of mine used to call untutored voices and proposals are now getting to the stage of being adopted without being weighed properly. And it seems to me that this argument on the face of it is a very I don't know what it is on the face of it, but let me just peel back the face of it. To me, it's a very strong argument because of, and here I'm going to do what Isabel did and tell you something that you should read, James Surowiecki's book, The Wisdom of Crowds, because his central argument bolsters that Atlantic piece very strongly. Surowiecki starts out with the story of uh, British, uh, is eugenicist too strong a word? And he was a statistician, and he was interested in whether people were idiots or not, which he rather thought they were on the whole. And he went to a fair where there was a contest. There was this ox standing there and people were asked to guess the weight of that ox once it was slaughtered and dressed, which is not a good thing to happen to you if you're an ox. And so he collected all the tickets after they, they'd uh, had their, their actual measurement and so on to look at the range of guesses. And here was what he found. The guesses are all over the map. Some of them are mind-bogglingly ridiculous, but the average was astoundingly close to the actual figure. And Sir Wiki goes through the book talking about the fact that time and again you find this. If you ask a bunch of people to guess how many jelly beans there are in a jar, you know, any individual person's chance of being right is about as great as their chance of flapping their arms and flying to the moon. But dependably, if you get a large number of people, the average will be close. And again, read the book. I'm not going to recite the whole thing here. One of the lessons that he draws from the book is that people en masse are much better at choosing among alternatives than they are deciding what alternatives they ought to be choosing among. And so there's a defense of democracy with a formal institutional structure in that if there is a winnowing process, say to choose two candidates in which the pros do their dirty work, and then you put those two candidates in front of the public, the public are likely to make a good choice between them. They are not so likely to make a really good choice as to who the candidate ought to be. And though, so, I would say to make a long story short, but you would laugh in my Too face. Late. Yes, you would laugh in my screen if I did that. The political party, as it evolved, is an elaborate, often cynical, ambitious, self-interested, greasy, and appalling organization with which no sane person would want to have anything to do. You don't mean that do. in a good way, though. Not particularly. My, my time in politics wasn't good for either of us. Uh, they did help to put better choices in front of the public, both programs and candidates than we see in an era of what people like Sir John A. Macdonald or George Washington would 
without hesitation, have condemned as mob rule. George Washington hated political parties, but he didn't want populism either. We did with the American Electoral College. It was set up precisely so that the people wouldn't get to vote directly for president because they might go off their rocker. Not that they would ever do mm -hmm. such a thing and wind up having a, with a choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I think it is fair to say that although virtually everybody else in the world except in lows and dictatorships can laugh at the Americans right now because their choices are not so bad, and ours weren't last election. Justin Trudeau versus Stephen Harper, hold your nose, vote for a third party, that's what I did, but it wasn't as bad. But we're in the same situation with the formal party structures broken down. And to take one example, in the parliamentary system, the leader used to be the person that caucus was willing to back. We didn't elect leaders of political parties or prime ministers in these gigantic free-for-alls, especially the liberal one where there were essentially no requirement to be in any way attached to the party to vote. They got a pretty popular choice in the short run, but a, somebody a lot of people think is unfit for office. We need to go back to those mediating structures. You don't wait till you're looking at Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton on the ballot to realize your system has gone too far in that direction. So yeah, I recommend the article. I recommend Surawicki's book, and I do recommend mediating structures and backroom children, even though I have absolutely no desire to be one of them or even to spend a lot of time with them. All right. Well, thanks for that, folks. If you want to play along and ask your question of the professor, you go to the URL on the screen and everything there will be explained. Thanks and see you next time.